So good morning, everybody. So about one month ago, we all stood here on the steps calling for uh, juvenile justice reform uh, as a result of the, uh, the crime and the violence that we're seeing in our cities and our towns. And so we embarked on a uh, bipartisan process where uh, some Democrats and Republicans in the Judiciary Committee got together and they met. And while these negotiations have been going on, uh, Democrats have been taken to the podium, they've been taken to the editorial boards, and they're sort of trying to rewrite the narrative and mischaracterize the position that Republicans are taking. And so we're here today just to set the record straight and to put forth what proposals that we are looking for and what reforms we think are necessary uh, for the betterment of the entire state of Connecticut, including our youth. Republicans are not merely calling for just incarceration. And we recognize the complexity of this issue. You know, on the one hand, we listen to Democrats saying that car thefts have gone down. And then on the other hand, we're hearing them say that uh, the, the car thefts have increased because of the pandemic. On one hand, we have funded youth enhancement programs to the tune of the numbers that we have not seen before. And on the other hand, we're hearing complaints that there isn't enough money for our youth programs. And regardless of how many cars are stolen and whether or not crime is on the rise or on the decrease, when somebody steals a vehicle, kills an individual with that vehicle, and they are charged with assault one as opposed to negligent homicide, we need to ask the question why. When a youth is arrested 40 times and not adjudicated into the system at all, the legislature needs to ask the question why. When somebody is arrested 13 times a juvenile and they're not uh, referred to DCF for additional services, the legislature needs to ask the question why. When somebody commits forcible rape and they're released after six hours. The legislature needs to ask the question why. And that was the point of our press conference about six weeks ago. We are not manufacturing this issue. If you talk to residents, you talk to our police force, you talk to our judicial, our probation, they all have stories to tell you on how the system is broken. And we are listening to these individuals. We are listening to our residents. We are listening to our police officers. We are not here to blame them. We are not going to accuse anyone of being ignorant of the law. But rather, we want to see how we can improve the state of Connecticut. Because if you speak to anybody, nobody feels that they're safer today than they were five years ago or two years ago. And so with that, I would like to turn over the podium uh, to Representative uh, Fishbein, who is our ranking member on the Judiciary Committee, who's been in these negotiations, and he will put forth our proposal. Good morning. Today, residents of our state go to bed at night concerned. Connecticut is concerned whether or not during that night their car will be stolen. Concerned whether or not during their night their car will be ransacked. Concerned whether or not an innocent person in our state is injured, harmed physically by a juvenile. Juvenile crime in this state is out of control. The House Republicans believe that to be unacceptable. The law-abiding residents of our state are looking for solutions. Just over a month ago, on July 7, we called for a special session. And that day, we started to have talks. We agreed that we would reach out to various collaterals, various stakeholders across the state, and get input from them. What are they looking for? To bounce ideas off of them. Those meetings entailed those with representatives of DCF, Public Defender's Office, the Judicial Branch, the State's Attorney's Office, the Chiefs of Police Association, and Post. 
It's become clear over the last few days that the Democrats don't want solutions here. And they continue to blame victims. I he constantly hear, lock your cars. But even if you do lock your car, the next blame is, well, you shouldn't have left that thing in your car. Quite frankly, just because I lock my, don't lock my car is not reason to ransack it or to steal it or to do anything else. The Democrats are quick to say, oh, it's just a property crime. No harm, no foul. But the problem is, that is just the problem. Because they don't realize that a property crime, that car being stolen, maybe if that person has a job, just prevented that person from being able to go to work, just prevented a mom from being able to bring their child to summer camp, just prevented a senior citizen from being able to go to their medical appointment. It's not just a property crime. Since the end of our regular session, the legislature has come into special session to deal with the emergency of recreational marijuana, to deal with the emergency of the pandemic, but has ignored the emergency of juvenile justice in this state. Today, House Republicans are preventing, are presenting juvenile justice reforms. But let me be clear, we are not in favor of incarcerating a child just because they steal their first car. Those children should have programs available to them, and we should be trying to get them into those programs quickly, not waiting weeks which our current system actually provides for. And those that don't learn from that first offense in those programs and escalate, because we see cases where now firearms are involved, violent incidents are involved, those cases should be dealt with on just as an escalating basis as the crimes are. Enough is enough. We should protect the individual personal rights of victims while assuring accountability and that those programs are available. Today, our plan calls for prevention, accountability, and rehabilitation. Some of those things are, you know, currently fingerprinting of juveniles is discretionary. We hear that the juvenile justice system is unfair that it doesn't work, that it is slanted against certain individuals. Well, I don't believe that. Leaving discretion for fingerprints just opens up the door to something like that. So we would have it be mandatory that if a juvenile is arrested for a felony, a class A misdemeanor, or um, a charge resulting from the loss of life or serious physical harm or injury, a sexual assault, that fingerprinting be mandatory should not be discretionary. We would have law enforcement have access to juvenile records. You know, this is something that you've heard about over the last few weeks, that when an officer goes to apply for a detention order, all they have before them is this arrest. And therefore, that's all they can put in the report. And then the judge is looking at it, says, okay, I just have this arrest. And they rule accordingly, justly. But that's not the whole picture. So law enforcement should have that whole picture so they can put that into their application. But also we want to know if those are being denied, why are they being denied? Something we did venture into this session, we asked the judicial branch to call out that data. But this, the other part of that is why. So we would have a judge articulate within 24 hours why they denied it to look at the system. Maybe what's in the law is not appropriate to meet our intent. We would also have expedited arraignments. You know, a few years ago, our state said we're taking domestic violence seriously. We said when there's going to be a domestic violence arrest, when there is a domestic violence arrest, there's going to be an arraignment the next day court is open. And that's a good thing. Well, let's say that juvenile justice is just as important. And let's have expedited arraignments of these youths so that we can get them into a program, if, if appropriate, if they're eligible for a program. Um, right now, 
that arraignment can be no longer than 14 days. A lot can happen in 14 days. We would also have, if a, if a youth has been arrested for stealing a car and they steal another car, that they're awaiting trial, they steal another car, that there would be automatic GPS monitoring. Um, of that because of course that's an escalation and that's a way to get at what's going on here. Another issue is that currently the juvenile matters where the arrest occurs is not where the case is being adjudicated. It should be adjudicated where the victims are, not where the criminals come from. You know I heard from the Democrats that that would be too burdensome on those that are accused to get them to court. And my retort is, well, it's too burdensome on the victims, the innocent people here. We would also have automatic transfers um, to be ramped up a bit here. You know, presently, there was a, there was a case in Greenwich where a 14-year-old was arrested for murder. And under our laws, the raise your age procedure that case cannot be transferred to adult court. It has to be adjudicated in a juvenile court. And the problem that, that extends to that is the maximum penalty for a conviction in juvenile court is 30 months of supervised probation for a murder. And then tied to that is upon the age of 22, that individual can ask the court to erase that conviction, and that is automatic. There is no discretion. That's not the justice that I think our citizens are looking for. So we would have automatic transfers um, for a Class A misdemeanor that results in loss of life or serious physical injury, a violent sexual assault, or one involving use of a firearm. We also learned when we met with DCF that we apparently have more diversionary programs than any other state in the country. Well, I want to know, we want to know, what are they, what do they do, and what is the recidivism rate with all of these programs? Because certainly there are programs out there, but we hear about other states and the success with their programs. Let's look at ours. So we would direct the judicial branch to do that study. We also have talked about victim impact panels. You, know, you do that with DUI cases many times. A judge will order someone who's arrested for DUI to sit before a group of people that have been affected by people driving under the influence. Um, you know, we would have the judicial branch look at, can they do the same thing here and have victim impact panels and allow a judge to, um, to order something like that? That's generally the high points on the plan that we bring here today and we hope that the legislature, the whole of the legislature, the other three caucuses wrap their arms around these common sense ideas and approaches to juvenile justice in our state, and I thank you. Thank you. With that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Can you just tell us what, what happened with, with the bipartisan talks? Are they now ended? Um, are you going to petition yourself into special session, just logistics. Sure, I'll, I'll have Representative Fishman answer the first part of it. The, the second part of the question is, we have submitted our petitions to call into special session. Uh, we've done that. We're asking for uh, our colleagues in, in the uh, Senate and the House to also sign a petition so we could reach that threshold to get us back into session. What have you been told in those talks that, that uh, to wait until the session starts next year? Are they amicable or just uh, this is not the time and they're not interested? What are you hearing? Well, just to go to back, back to Christine's question, Susan, I'll, I'll deal with that also. Um, you know, last Wednesday we did have um, a, a meeting and um, we talked about um, many of the proposals that you've heard here today. Um, you know, a lot of the response was lock your car. Um, and we ended up with a press conference on Friday where it was claimed that this crisis was manufactured. Um, in fact, there was a reference to 11-154, Public Act 11-154, which um, 
was heralded during that press conference. And when you read it, you'll see that part of that public act is actually the problem. Because what it says is that if um, a judge cannot detain a youth unless they find there's no reasonable alternative, which many times is sending the child back home. Um, it's very subjective. One of our changes that I didn't get into would have a criteria for that. Um, so th the talks are broken down. Um, and Susan, I forgot what you asked. Well, I, I think you've answered the question that they've, they've broken down. So there's no, well, we'll tackle this next year. They we can't know. wait for next year. We've been trying to get something done all session long. We put in bills, in fact, uh, HB 6669, uh, was the bill that came out of the Judiciary Committee uh, that had the GPS monitoring in it. Um, you know, for whatever reason, the Democrats did not allow that bill when it got sent to a probe to even have a vote. They killed it. So, you know, we've been pretty serious. We continue to be serious. And I, I don't think the people of Connecticut are willing to wait for next session. It's un, unreasonable. voters in the election. Yeah, and I think it's part of the point of this press conference today. Uh, we are not the ones that have gone out in the past six weeks and characterized how these negotiations have gone. And yet what I'm finding is the opposite, that they are using this for, for politics and trying to um, redirect the conversation away from what residents want. And so this press conference is in part driven by the fact that we believe there's a lot of misinformation and mischaracterization out there from the Democrats, and we want to set the record straight. Some of these proposals, would they require like a, a huge influx of cash or major changes to the juvenile system, like the, the part about the next day arraignments, things like that? Would that be a major change to the system? When we met with the judicial branch, we did speak to them about uh, seven days. And there was no um, pushback of, about money at all. Um, you know, we do have that process uh, in the regular adult court for the next day arraignments for um, domestic violence cases. So I don't see that. Um, in all candor, I think the, the one part of the plan that would um, have a cost is the GPS monitoring. Um, you know, in conjunction with HB 6669, a fiscal note was generated which um, said it was about a million dollars. That was the estimate. Um, and, and some of the things that I heard were, well, you know, that's too costly. In fact, you heard that at the press conference on Friday. Their plan is too costly, was what somebody said. Um, but for, you know, the fact of the matter is a million dollars with all of the millions, billions that we spend in this, in this state to say to the residents of our state that a million dollars is not worth it, you can take away the message. So you haven't received really any pushback from the juvenile courts at all? or we Received no pushback from the juvenile courts. I see you're talking about, uh, you know, waiving the six-hour limit uh, and someone makes a good faith effort. Well, first of all, who gets to decide that's a good faith effort? And should we trust the police to, to, to say, yeah, I make a good faith effort? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, and we would have the language drafted to, to create that criteria. So certainly you don't want an officer who has an ability to file that application to sit there for six hours and at, you know five hours and 59 minutes to submit an application. It's, it's good faith as we do with many things with law enforcement. You know and then of course you know you're going to have some sort of a maximum. But what we learned when we met with um, the Chiefs of Police Association many times when these applications are sought, it's taking an officer off of the road for the balance of their shift. Um, so certainly if an application is put in, you know, I think six hours is reasonable to put it in. If you didn't put it in in six hours, I don't think there's any good faith. Um, but certainly if the judge is waiting, and we have this whole aspect of now the officer is going to have to hook up with, or they should, hook up with uh, probation to get that information. There may be a delay in that. Uh, but the fact that we just have to, you know, draconian let a youth out um, on the six hours to be strict on that 
is just unreasonable. On detention. I mean, if, if, if some of these kids, if it's not, it's not working, it's not working. Why, why, I don't see anything on your, on your agenda regarding detention. Well, we, we did. One of the points does have to do with looking at whether or not CJTS could be used um, as well as group homes um, for uh, some sort of uh, detention for nonviolent offenders. I think that's um, the third to the last point. Um, the governor did say something um, a few weeks ago about group homes and DCF, and I think his impression is that we have a lockdown group homes somewhere. We don't, um, we learned from DCF. None of them are secure facilities, um, but that should be looked at um, to perhaps use that as a vehicle. You know, $57 million was spent on building, establishing CJTS. You know, perhaps it could be used for juvenile um, educational training, for employment, those kinds of things in a residential setting. That would be one way to deal with this without uh, punitively harming. And would there be any state funding for the uh, municipal property tax credit? That is not anticipated at this point. And the municipal property tax credit that's contemplated here is when we met with one of the uh, police groups, um, one of the towns had let us know that they had instituted a program where they gave out clubs, um, you know, the, the red thing that you do with your steering wheel and your um, accelerator, to their residents for free, and apparently it had um, almost eliminated car theft in their town. So the thought here was to empower a town to be able to develop some sort of a program to get a property tax credit. Um, at this point, there's no contemplated uh, set off with regard to that. Craig, what kind of uh, uh, GPS uh, program are you talking about? The classic bracelet, uh, passive 24 hour surveillance of these uh, juveniles? The bracelet system that's similar to the uh, Soberlink or the system that they presently have in criminal court. Um, we have not looked at the cost of of expanding that program. Um, I would believe that because our bill had dealt with that uh, almost expressly, the million dollars would be sufficient. Can you talk a little bit about the bipartisan support that you do have? You have a bunch of folks from Glastonbury. The Glastonbury state rep is here. Can we talk a little bit with her? We've certainly had um, a lot of support from um, both from the other side of the aisle. Um, you know, I understand the position, um, but there certainly has been, there certainly is support. I mean, if we look at when, um, at the end of session, we ran an amendment on SB2, which um, had some of these changes in it, and members of the Democratic Party did support that at that time also, but I'll turn yeah, it over. Just I want to I want to thank Representative Barry for being here. Um, it, this is not a partisan issue. This is obviously impacting uh, her district and many other Democrat districts throughout Connecticut. Uh, and so I think people are sharing concerns as well. Um, and, and I think it's important for us to sort of take these proposals out there um, so that um, people people can see that it's not just a, a partisan issue. It is a bipartisan issue. And what's been done up until now is, is you know, our silence has allowed uh, some of the leadership in the Democrat Party to characterize a position that Republicans have taken, um, and that's just not the case. And so uh, I think there are people generally here that share our, our concerns, and we have been very open uh, with conversations with people on what these proposals look like and see if we could garner support from the other side of the aisle. What's been going on across the table? Are they accepting of some of these ideas? Are they saying summarily no way? Well, you know, based on what happened on Friday, you, you have two of the, the three leaders in these negotiations that came out and held that press conference uh, mischaracterizing our proposals um, and setting a narrative that, to me, really went against the spirit of the negotiations. And so today, we are here to set the record straight, and it's obvious to me that these individuals are, are not here to negotiate in good faith. 
um, they're here to, to advance their own spin uh, on this narrative. Maybe Representative Barry could comment on that. I know Blastberry has been a town very hard hit. We've actually had a chance to talk to the police in that town. Who have made a very bold that something has to be done. In fact, they had said that when they arrest juveniles uh, who have been arrested before, they laugh at them and say that, you know, I know I'm not going to get caught. So uh, is that what brought you forward here today? And have you had conversations with your local police? Yes, I have. Uh, <laughs> conversations with my local police uh, quite often. Um, everything you said is true. Um, I stand here. This is not a party issue to me. This is a public safety issue. And I stand with my community. And my community is demanding action. And I hear them. And that is why I am here today. Can I ask Craig one more question, please? Craig, on the, uh, the access to juvenile records, what would have to be done to be able to check on the kids' record uh, in the field? Presently or what, under the what, plan? What, would, what do you think? Uh, well, right now, just like um, when you apply, when an officer applies for an arrest warrant in a particular jurisdiction, there's a judge who's assigned to communicate with that officer. Similar to that, you'd have a probation officer, a juvenile probation officer, that is assigned to that night, we'll just say, Officer wants to get a detention order. Okay, which juvenile probation officer is on call? I'm going to call that individual, get access to the records, and decide whether or not first to apply for it, looking at the full record, or once you've done that, say, hey, yeah, I think that this would be good in, in light of public safety. I, I don't think it would take an awful lot other than that assignment. Blind spot in the current uh, system? I would, and it's not only a glaring blind spot, but the fact that we've been talking about this glaring blind spot for over a month and the fact that nothing has been done uh, speaks volumes here. Well, who could do it? Could judiciary do it? Could the, the chief state's attorney do it? I believe judiciary could do it. I believe that the judicial branch could employ that unilaterally on their own. Um, uh, you know, why people are just standing still and not doing these things that make common sense to everyone else in the world, I, I don't know. Could you talk a little bit about the proposal for expanding cases for mandatory transfer to adult court? Uh, what about the adult system um, is, what's lacking in the juvenile system that the adult system can make up for in your mind? Well, one aspect is that, you know, in juvenile court, the cases are sealed. Um, you know, these cases uh, become public. Um, you know, anybody can walk into a criminal court. Also, the penalty, I mean, which I spoke about before. You know, if, if one commits a murder and they are convicted of the murder in adult court, there is a severe penalty. I forget exactly what it is, but it is years of incarceration. In juvenile court, the same crime, the maximum penalty is 30 months of supervised probation. Um, you know, making that an automatic transfer, I think, would be the appropriate way to deal with that same crime. Understanding th that the youth um, is a youth and individuals that are arrested um, the first time um, have many diversionary programs and would have a diversionary program for that as well. And um, that is, I believe, to be an appropriate way to deal with that particular crime. Um, you know, loss of life, serious physical injury, those are all, I mean, Everybody who goes to criminal court doesn't go to jail. Uh, that, that is just not the truth. So it's the adjudication of the case in the appropriate courtroom using the appropriate rules is the reason for the change. Use of a firearm. I mean, if somebody uses a firearm to perpetrate a crime, 
Those are all things that are addressed by that, that transfer. On the potential use of CJTS, uh, would you propose that it still be a secure facility? I guess my question is, would the fences remain, would the doors remain locked, or would it be a more open complex on, in your mind? Well, I would want to see the study first. I, I, the, the proposal calls for a study to have various stakeholders look at that, look at group homes also. And perhaps that study comes back and says that the building needs to be raised and used for some other purpose. Um, but it remains there. And as I said before, $57 million was spent on creating that facility. And um, you know, when it was appropriated, one would think that it would be used for a long time. I don't come here with um, you know, preconceived notions as to the utilization of that, that facility. I would want to see the study that we've asked for and then to look at that, vet it, to have a public hearing, all of those things. That would be the intent. Can you clarify something? You had mentioned a Greenwich case early. It's my understanding that when it comes to felony and murder, that even though it's a juvenile, that those crimes with such egregious circumstances, those are not always for a juvenile court. Were there circumstances with that? I mean, so the raise your age situation that went into place in 2015 said that any crime under the age of 15 could not go to adult court. So that is the distinction there. And, and, and in that particular case, that 14-year-old, it's not the first time that they were arrested. They've actually been arrested. This is the 10th arrest in the last two years. Um, and when I look at what I've seen about the record, it's, it's escalation. You know, it starts with a fight at school. And then, you know, there's a, there's a fight at, at some store. And then there's illegal discharge of a firearm. And then there's suspect in another homicide that evidently they couldn't link up. And then we get to this. So these are the kinds of things we're looking to prevent. Um, so. I have a press conference on Friday. They mentioned that that 2019 figures for car thefts were at an all-time low. And that's actually, a, the, the, the juvenile justice system is actually a story of success. What do you say to that? So this is 2021, uh, not 2019. And when we look at arrests, we are looking at arrests. We're not looking at car thefts. So that's a very important distinction. You know, just because somebody, their car is stolen, but nobody is arrested, doesn't mean the car didn't get stolen. And that's the problem with looking at just the crime and not the victims. So let's look at the car thefts, and I think you'll see that those numbers are, are different. Um, you know, blaming the pandemic on, on this, I just don't think is appropriate. How many car thefts in 2021 so far? State police have not released those figures. Has there been any thought given to uh, holding the parents of these repeat offenders, especially the repeat violent offenders, more accountable? The, there has been thought. Um, I have rejected, personally rejected, that's vicarious liability. Uh, however, part of our plan does allow a court to order a DCF investigation as to what's going on in the family home, um, which sometimes, you know, I've, throughout my career as a lawyer, I've worked hand in hand with DCF, uh, sometimes against, sometimes with, um, and I think that would be a good thing. Um, so sometimes that can get there. The Democrats have talked about, you know, poverty and how these offenders mainly are coming from poor families in the cities. And I, I mean, do you see that as a, a lame excuse? Or how do you see that when, you, when they talk about the reasons that these kids reoffend? I mean, certainly there's many reasons why we are seeing uh, people reoffend and, and high risk individuals and I think that is a broader conversation that we continue to have um, you know this year through the Ar uh, ARPA money you know we are able to enhance services but we already have things out there like project longevity um, we have the fatherhood initiative to try to address uh, individuals home life situations 
to put them on a better track. I think we need to look at our, our uh, school systems and what opportunities are given these children. And so that is something we're also willing to talk about. But we also believe uh, for today, uh, the issues right now that we're focusing on is really the, the, the system itself. Um, and it really is failing. This system is not just failing our residents, but it's failing the youth that are committing these crimes as well. What was it failing them? By not locking them up? When an individual is arrested 40 times and not, not adjudicated, um, when there aren't any DCF referrals or wraparound services offered to them, it's failing them. And what we're finding right now is that police officers, uh, there is no, no process in place right now uh, that for these individuals to be evaluated and services be given to them. So one of our proposals that we have is to make sure that when, an, when a youth is arrested, uh, that they are evaluated for those services as well as a DCF referral if it's appropriate. appropriate. Well, thank you all for coming.